So I, think, I think one of the reasons that it flies without, without even being challenged for evidence mm -hmm. is that there is a certain vision of how the world is, and in that world, men are oppressing women. And therefore, when you say something like this, it fits the vision. And that's the end of it. There's no, there's no d demand for evidence. You, you have in, in your book sort of a, a, a series toward the beginning of how the actual process works of forming one of these ideas and yes. selling it and rejecting the proof. Maybe you could just kind of yes, march it through this there, as, there's a, a four, as a model of it. All right, there's a four-stage uh, uh, um, pattern. And in the first stage is what, what's what I call the crisis. And so we're hyped to believe that something is a terrible crisis for which something must be done. Uh, and uh, what, was, what was fascinating to me in doing the research for the book is that very often the thing that's said to be in crisis has often been getting better for years on end. But that gets ignored. Then the second stage for, is... For example, infant mortality, to, to use one of the Well, uh, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about um, um, uh, preg uh, teenage pregnancy and, and venereal disease. Uh, those things were getting better. Teenage pregnancy was going down for more than a decade before sex education was introduced. Venereal disease, uh, syphilis in 1960s, uh, was only ha had only half the incidence that it had in 1950. So all these things are going down, yet, yet we're said to need sex education to deal with this crisis, which is then manufactured. And again, this is where the calculated part comes in. Now, 99% of the people who hear this don't, un don't know that. And, but, but the reason they accept it is because they also share the same vision. And because this is consonant with that vision, they don't have to ask for evidence. All right, so what's, what's stage two? That, that stage two is the, the, the is first the, one is there's a crisis. Yes. They establish a crisis, usually an artificial one. Yes. Okay. Uh, then, then, then stage two is the solution. You have a solution for this crisis. In this case, you have sex education in the schools. And then uh, at that point, you say, if, if we do this, this will lead to beneficial result A. The critics say, no, it will lead to detrimental result Z. Stage three, you put it in the results, you put it in and directly you find detrimental result Z, namely venereal disease and teenage pregnancy take off into the stratosphere. And then stage four is the fascinating part in which they simply say, no, that doesn't prove that this was a bad policy because there are many factors. There's complexity. It's simplistic to blame it on this. But they run through this routine on so many different things, including crime. Similarly, they said, you know, in 1960, uh, Judge Bazelon said we just desperately need to have some kind of change in the criminal justice system. Now, in 1960, uh, there were fewer murders than there had been in 1950, 1940, or 1930. Uh, but again, that was completely ignored. And so now we have the revolution in the criminal justice system. People say, no, if you have to put these new things in, there'll be more crime than before. They put them in. Uh, almost instantly, the declining crime rate turns around and heads up again. And they say, no, it's simplistic to blame this on, on this. There are the root causes and the neglect of society and all the rest of it. So it's heads I win, tails you lose. Some of the revolution's record is well known. Four years ago, on the 50th anniversary of the approval of the birth control pill, there was an outpouring of commentary and reflection, most of it positive. The revolution, it was claimed and acclaimed in Time magazine and other secular venues, had leveled the playing field in the economic marketplace between men and women as it had never been leveled before. It had also confirmed, conferred freedom on women such that they had never known before. Both those propositions are true as far as they go, but there's another side of the ledger that's been mostly ignored by a mainstream society saturated with the revolution's pleasures. With every passing year, more evidence accumulates that will someday change that predominant happy storyline. I'd like to start with a little story that captures the scale of that change in a snapshot. I grew up in a series of small towns scattered across beautiful and forbidding upstate New York. North of the Hudson River Valley, a planet away from New York City, in an area known as the Leather Stocking Region, where author James Fenimore Cooper set his famous tales. This was, and still is, rural blue-collar country. It was the kind of place where more local boys in the 60s went to Vietnam than went to colleges and universities. In many ways, a lot about this place is still the same as it was when I was a child with one massive exception, which we'll call the family thing. In the 1960s, most men in this area worked as manual laborers, mainly in 
local copper and silver mills. Many women, if they married, stayed home. Most families, no matter how chaotic, were still intact, religious and non-religious alike. One of my strongest memories from those years is an odd but significant one. In 1972, just months before the legalization of abortion, a teenage girl in town became pregnant. The baby's father was a young soldier, newly returned from Vietnam. The town gossips were up in arms because, as it turned out, he didn't plan to marry her. In those days, that was considered shocking. Although pregnant brides were not exactly unknown, and pregnant teenage brides for that matter, men who didn't marry their pregnant girlfriends were objects of opprobrium. Eventually, the girl had the baby somewhere else where adoption followed. She came back and finished high school, to my knowledge, without stigma. But the stigma that does remain memorable was the other one, the one about her boyfriend. The idea that he should have taken responsibility, which the majority of adults in that era certainly seemed to believe, is an idea that's now gone, vanished with the revolution. Now fast forward some 20 years. In the 19, early 1990s, I went back for a visit to the same town and I saw a former teacher. She told me that in the high school that year, in a class of 200 graduating seniors, one third of the girls were pregnant. Not one was married. And of course, we can safely assume there were other pregnancies besides the visible ones, because various girls were also rumored to have gotten abortions. This too wasn't the shock in 1992 that it was in 1972, because after all, Roe versus Wade had been the law of the land for two decades. So here's the take home from my story. From one scandalous pregnancy in a rural high school in the 1970s to many non-scandalous pregnancies in the same school by the 1990s, that's one snapshot showing how the sexual revolution has changed the world. Um, so to go to that earliest example that you gave, you think the increase in uh, a venereal disease was caused by, by sex education? I don't education. have to even say that. I don't even have to, have to believe that. All yeah. I have to say but is do they... You, but do you? Oh, I think, I, I think it's, it's hard to explain otherwise. I mean, you, know, you don't get social changes that drastic in a, in a few years without some particular cause. But I, I, that, the, the argument doesn't depend on that at all. The point is, they created the crisis artificially. The evidence shows there was no crisis. Uh, and when, and, but they would not sub even subject it to any empirical test. If they want to show some other factor came in and really caused this, I'm happy to hear that. 